inmates at medium security prison Southern Desert Correctional Center caused a riot on December 8th. I never lived in your society. I never went to school. I never had a mother and father. I raised myself up. It's something that I've become all that accustomed to and that I'm, you know, and that I'm strong and uh, uh, nothing's bothering. It started with surrogates at that non-human level. Physical objects, my possessions, other people's, destruction of things that are cared about. I play hardball. I played baseball when I was younger. Huh? I wouldn't go there. When Combs didn't get his way, he was violent. And he subjected victims to physical, emotional, and verbal abuse so that they would participate in the freak-offs. Celebrities just keep getting more and more disturbed by the day, don't they? This Sean Combs case is nuts. Diddy's never been a stranger to controversy, but these allegations dating back to the early 90s are just a whole other beast. First in 2017, a former personal chef of his named Cindy Rula made allegations of essay against him. Then Casey Ventura came out saying he was involved in human trafficking and essay. More and more things started coming out, all of it incredibly twisted. He'd apparently throw these big parties which some of his other rich and famous friends would attend and lure women to and bad stuff would happen. Combs' home was then raided back in March and a bunch of his electronics were seized and on September 16th he was arrested and is being charged with trafficking and racketeering. He's also been denied bail as Judge Andrew L. Carter Jr. is concerned about witnesses being threatened or intimidated. With the mountain of evidence and people making allegations against him, it is not looking good for Puff. Rebecca Butterfield is known as one of Australia's most dangerous female prisoners. She first landed herself in prison in 1996. She was convicted of crimes related to illicit substances, breaking and entering, and property damage. But she didn't do a lot of time and was released, but things would just get far worse in the years to come. In 2000, she attacked her neighbor, who was trying to prevent Butterfield from harming herself, leading to a charge of grievous bodily harm. This resulted in a three-year sentence, but while at Silverwater Women's Prison, she committed an even more serious crime. Butterfield attacked a fellow inmate, Bruce Lim Wars, brutally slashing at her with a blade and killing her. This earned her an additional 12 years behind bars, and later authorities deemed her too dangerous for society, adding another five years to her sentence. Butterfield has made it very clear that if she were ever released, she would kill again. In January of 2021, she appeared at the Supreme Court to seek her release, but her request was thankfully denied. Next, we have Robert Maudsley, aka the Brain Eater, an English prisoner born in 1953 who's so dangerous he's been locked in solitary confinement since 1983. And with a nickname like Brain Eater, that's not all that surprising. In 1974, Maudsley met a man named John Farrell who ended up showing Maudsley pictures of young people he had harmed. Maudsley ended up killing the depraved man, which of course landed him in court. He ended up being sent to a psychiatric hospital where he locked himself in a cell with a man named David Francis, tormenting him for several hours before finally taking his life. In all fairness, David Francis was also a complete scumbag whose crimes were along the same lines as Maudsley's first victim, John Farrell. For this crime, he was sent to Wakefield Prison where he would end up killing two prisoners on the same day in 1978. His original goal had been seven. Again, all these guys were pretty terrible people. Then a special two-cell unit was built in the basement of Wakefield where Maudsley has been kept ever since. He's only ever let out on occasion and when he is, he's accompanied by several heavily armed officers. As for where he gets the Brain Eater nickname, he was rumored to have eaten part of the brain of one of his victims, although that very well may be an urban legend. Richard McNair may be one of the most dangerous and clever criminals in American history. It all started in 1987 with a botched robbery in Minnow, North Dakota. While attempting to steal from a home, McNair encountered two men. In the chaos, he fired at them. One man was severely injured, the other died. He was pulled in for questioning in February of 1988, 
and ended up confessing, but he managed to escape from the police station where he was being held. He was caught after a couple hours and handcuffed to a chair, but that didn't stop him. Using a lip balm, McNair slipped out of his handcuffs and fled for a second time, leading officers on a foot chase. He was recaptured shortly after and ended up receiving two life sentences for his crimes. Then in 1992, he made another escape from the North Dakota State Penitentiary with two other inmates. Again, he was caught just hours later, but his most infamous escape happened in 2006 while he was at a federal penitentiary in Louisiana. He managed to pack himself up and get mailed out of the prison. An officer ran into him just a few blocks away, but McNair managed to convince this guy that he was just a friendly jogger. And for 10 whole months, he was free, using stolen identities and even making his way to Canada. But in 2007, he was finally apprehended again. Will Richard McNair ever be let out of prison? I don't know, but it sounds like it's really just up to him whenever he feels like escaping again. Charles Cullen, often referred to as the Angel of Death, is perhaps the most prolific serial killer in American history. Will he ever be set free? Well, well, not until 2403 at the very earliest, so no. Born on February 22nd, 1960 in West Orange, New Jersey, Cullen grew up to become a nurse and found work at St. Barnabas Medical Center in Livingston, New Jersey. And this is where the nightmare began. Cullen's first confessed kill took place on June 11th, 1988, when he gave a patient a lethal overdose of intravenous medication. By the time he left St. Barnabas in 1992, Cullen claimed to have taken the lives of numerous patients. Just a month after leaving, he started a new job at Warren Hospital in Phillipsburg, where he continued this spree, taking the lives of three elderly women with overdoses of a heart medication, and he didn't stop there. At Hunterton Medical Center in Flemington, Cullen caused the deaths of at least five more patients using the same medication. Wherever he worked, death followed him. Somehow his actions went unnoticed for years until he was arrested on December 12th, 2003. He'd only been implicated in two cases, but once in custody, Cullen revealed the truly staggering number of victims he was actually responsible for, claiming to have killed about 400 people. And his explanation? Well, he claimed he was helping his patients escape their pain. Joanna Dennehy is one of the most notorious female criminals in the UK. In March of 2013, three bodies were discovered in ditches outside Peterborough. In addition, two injured men were found in Hereford, but they survived. At first, investigators thought the attacker was a man, but turned out the perpetrator was a woman named Joanna Dennehy. Dennehy, along with her partner in crime, Gary Stretch, had a chilling plan to take the lives of nine men later claiming that they were doing it purely for entertainment. Dennehy would make it very well known, once she was apprehended, that she found killing to be oddly satisfying and felt an uncontrollable urge to continue after her first experience. In November of 2013, Dennehy pleaded guilty to her crimes and was sent to HM Prison at Bronzefield. During her trial, she showed little to no remorse, even laughing at times during proceedings. She was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 19 years. Scott Lee Kimball is a convicted serial killer and fraudster from Boulder County, Colorado. Over a two-year period, he killed at least four people, and investigators suspect him in up to 21 other unsolved cases. Kimball's criminal activities began when he was working as an informant for the FBI, which paid him and offered protection for his own legal troubles. Most of the info he provided the FBI turned out to be useless and false as well. Now, while running a legitimate business selling organic beef, Kimball was doing his fraudulent schemes behind the scenes. He forged documents, passed bad checks, which led to criminal charges in four western states by 2003. His fraudster skills aided in his truly evil crimes though, allowing him to create false evidence that his victims were still alive after he'd taken their lives. He even used their credit cards and bank accounts to continue his fraudulent activities after killing them. Two of his victims were people he knew personally, the daughter of his third wife and his own uncle. Some family members and investigators also believe that a 2004 car accident that severely injured his oldest son was actually an attempt to kill him for insurance money, but no charges have ever been filed for that incident. The investigation into a check fraud scheme in 2006 eventually led authorities to uncover his killings. Kimball ultimately pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 70 years for his crimes. 
This is Andre Barros, nicknamed Psycho. He killed five people in San Luis Valley area of Southern Colorado in 2020. Barros was arrested and ultimately pled guilty to five counts of first degree killing and five counts of tampering with deceased human bodies. He was also slapped with kidnapping charges. After taking the lives of his victims, he would dispose of them near the New Mexico border, dismembering and burning their remains in pits. In May of 2024, he was sentenced to life in prison, ensuring he will never be released. His brutal actions and the way he handled his victims make him just a prime example of a prisoner who should never be set free. Joseph James D'Angelo is known by a lot of names. The Creek Bed Killer, the original Night Stalker, the Diamond Knot Killer, and more. And luckily, he's exactly where he belongs, prison. He's a former police officer responsible for a series of horrifying crimes in California between 1974 and 1986. Born on November 8th, 1945 in Bath, New York, he terrorized communities with burglaries, essay, and killings. D'Angelo would often break into homes, tying up and frightening his victims before tormenting and killing them. For decades, his crimes went completely unsolved, but in 2018, he was arrested thanks to DNA evidence that linked him to one of his crimes. In June of 2020, he pleaded guilty to numerous charges, and on August 21st, 2020, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Eric Rudolph is a notorious criminal known for a series of bombings across the United States, including the 1996 Centennial Olympic Park attack in Atlanta, Georgia. Born on September 19, 1967 in Merritt Island, Florida, Rudolph took the lives of two people and injured over a hundred others in this attack. His explosives targeted not only the Olympic event, but also abortion clinics and a gay nightclub. Rudolph became a fugitive after the attacks, evading capture for more than five years. He lived in the wilderness of North Carolina, managing to stay hidden while law enforcement searched for him. In 2003, though, he was finally arrested after being discovered rummaging through a trash bin. In 2005, he pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Starting off our list today, we have Christopher Scarver, the man who in 1994 took the life of none other than Jeffrey Dahmer while serving time at the Columbia Correctional Institute in Wisconsin for killing a man named Steve. Steve Lohman in 1990. The pair arrived at the prison around the same time, and right away, Scarver detested Dahmer. But he was also kind of scared of him. I mean, I really don't blame him. Dahmer did kill 17 people and consume the body parts of a number of his victims as well. So yeah, Scarver kept his distance. Until one night when he, Dahmer, and another inmate by the name of Jesse Anderson, who was jailed for killing his wife, were made to clean the bathrooms of the prison. During which time Scarver went to grab a mop. And when he returned, he saw Anderson and Dahmer laughing. He snapped and he grabbed a metal bar and he struck Dahmer twice and then he beat Anderson both to death. In an interview, Scarver later claimed that he had become repulsed by Dahmer's behavior, his jokes, and the way he often organized his food to look like a human body in the prison cafeteria. After killing Dahmer and Anderson, Scarver was given two more life sentences. Next up, we've got James Elliott, who on March 18th of 2017 beat Donald Harvey aka the angel of death to death inside of Harvey's own cell. So who is James Elliott and who was Donald Harvey? Well, James Elliott was a burglar and Donald Harvey was a serial killer who worked as a nurse's aide and often smothered his victims to death with pillows. While Harvey claims to have killed around 70 people, he was only ever convicted of killing 37, which is not a small number by any means. But of course, Harvey claims it was more as they always do. Anyways, in March of 2017, Elliot entered Harvey's cell and beat him inches away from death. Harvey later died of his injuries and Elliot confessed to killing him, claiming that he had wanted to do something constructive for the friends and neighbors he had stolen from and that he had also wanted the attention of prison officials because he was unhappy with the quality of life in the penitentiary as were many other of the inmates there. The act was premeditated and Elliot was given a life sentence for killing which was was a big step up from the time he was serving for burglary. Next up, we have Thomas Terrible Tommy Silverstein and Clay Fountain, who on the same day separately fatally attacked 
prison guards escorting them through the grounds of Marion Prison. Both events took place on October 22nd of 1983, with the first attack being at the hands of Terrible Tommy, who had originally been arrested on charges of armed robbery but had since caused two other deaths behind bars. That day, Tommy was being escorted to his cell by a prison guard named Merle Klutz when another inmate handed Tommy a shank, which he then used to impale Klutz 40 times, killing him. Just eight hours later, in the same prison, Clay Fountain was being transferred by Robert Hoffman and two other guards when he was handed a shank by a fellow inmate, which he then used to attack the guards. Hoffman managed to save two of them before being attacked himself, after which he made his way to his son, another guard at the prison, before dying in his arms. This was the first and only time that three officers were killed on the same day in the same prison in two separate incidents. After the attack, Marion Prison went into a 23-year super lockdown that consisted of strict prisoner confinement to their cells, and both Tommy and Clayton were placed into solitary confinement in soundproof cells where the lights were kept on for 24 hours a day. Next up, we have James E. Day, who took the life of fellow inmate Nathan Leopold, a former child prodigy who, prior to the spring of 1924, met a man named Richard Leob. Richard and Nathan quickly became close. So close, in fact, that rumors began circulating about whether or not the two had entered into an intimate relationship, although both men adamantly denied this. During their time spent together, both Nathan and Richard became increasingly obsessed with the idea of carrying out the perfect crime, and so on May 21st, they decided to give it a shot. They forcibly took a young man from his home, killed him with a chisel, and then disposed of his body. They then sent a ransom note to the man's parents, who had at that time already contacted police. The two were sentenced to life in prison for the killing, with an additional 99 years each for forcible confinement. While guards were ordered to keep Richard and Nathan, who had turned on each other very aggressively during the course of the trial apart, they eventually ended up together, as they seemed to, and they even started a school while inside the prison. One night while Richard was showering, James Day came into the shower and he slashed him 50 times with an old-fashioned shaving razor. He claimed that Richard had made a pass at him, but considering the fact that Day had attacked Richard from behind, police believe that the true motive is still unknown. Now, usually at the halfway point, I try to keep things light, but today, that's not the case. On October 1st of 2011, two inmates worked together to take the life of a fellow inmate, Mitchell Harrison, in an incredibly gruesome and drawn out way. Both perpetrators, Nathan Mann and Michael Parr, had been serving life sentences for killing when Harrison arrived at the prison to serve an intermediate sentence for the violation of a young woman. One night, presumably after discovering what Harrison had been booked for, Mann and Parr lured Harrison into their jail cell, held him down, and cut his throat using plastic cutlery and a razor blade. They then impaled him in the eye with a pen before removing his internal organs. The two had plans to share in eating Harrison's liver, but decided against it when met with the organ face to face. In the past, Parr had alluded to fantasies of eating parts of another human, but it seems as though when actually given the opportunity, he decided that it likely wouldn't be all it was cracked up to be. That's disgusting. Okay, for this next one, I'm gonna switch things up just a bit because instead of an evil prisoner committing a crime in jail, this one is actually about an evil prison guard or an evil group of prison guards, rather. You see, in 2009, a man named Rocrast Mack was arrested for attempting to sell $10 worth of an illicit substance to an undercover police officer. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 20 years in prison to be served at the Ventress Correctional Facility in Clayton, Alabama, which was built to house just 650 prisoners, but at the time of his incarceration was well over capacity as it held 1,665. On the night of August 4th in 2010, during a nightly headcount, a guard by the name of Melissa Brown accused Mac of partaking in some adult extracurricular activities with his hand 
under his blanket. You guys know what I mean. When he told her that wasn't true, she struck him twice with her baton, which led to Mac in turn hitting her in the lip. He then ran away but stopped when ordered to halt by another guard. He was then taken to the dorm lobby and surrounded by Lieutenant Mitchell Smith along with five other guards who took turns beating him into a coma, which eventually led to his death. Lieutenant Smith, who had been accused of brutality on at least four previous occasions, was charged with killing as well as two other guards were also charged with killing who partook in the beating. What happened to the rest of them? I don't know, probably got off scot-free. You guys know how it is. Next up, we have Joseph Druce, who on August 23rd of 2003 killed a priest. Well, an ex-priest, I guess. You see, in January of 2002, Boston-born Catholic priest John Johan was convicted of doing that stereotypical priest thing involving young men. Gohan was convicted on one count of the crime, but accused of 130. Not only that, but 86 plaintiffs also filed a $10 million lawsuit against the Archdiocese of Boston because of what Gohan had done. He was put in to protective custody, but he still shared a cell and with none other than Joseph Druce, a self-proclaimed racist who had been sentenced to life in prison after killing a man who had picked him up while hitchhiking. After claiming that the former priest had made a pass at him, Druce decided to block the door of their cell and then kill him by forcibly restricting his airways and then stomping him to death. Many people believe that the guards on duty actually turned a blind eye to the event as when it happened, there was only one guard on duty, there's usually two, but that one guard did nothing to intervene in the situation. So it seems that they were not totally opposed to these actions. Next up, we have Robert Stewart, a violent prisoner with a past of psychological issues, violence, and racism. On March 31st of 2001, Robert was moved into the cell of Zahid Mubarak, who had been sentenced to just 90 days in prison for stealing just $12 worth of razor blades and was of Pakistani descent. That night, Stewart, who had already impaled another inmate to death and had records of over 186 incidents of violence act and had records of over 186 incidents of violent acts since his incarceration, broke the leg off a table and beat Mubarak to death. After the incident, Stuart was moved into isolation where he marked the symbol of a well-known hate group onto the floor before falling asleep 30 minutes later, showing absolutely no signs of remorse. An investigation was launched to look into whether or not the prison should be held responsible due to negligence, and protocols were then put in place for high-risk prisoners to avoid future incidents. Next up, we've got Jimmy Farah and Dennis Eversoll, who in March of 1975 brutally killed fellow inmate Charles Schmid while serving time in the Arizona State Prison in Florence. Charles Schmid was a short man who often stuffed his boots with flattened cans and newspapers so that he would appear taller. He was sentenced to life in prison after violating and killing three young women during the 1960s alongside his accomplices, his girlfriend Mary French and his friend John Saunders. Jimmy Farah, one of Schmidt's assailants, was in jail for killing in the second degree and attacking someone with a deadly weapon and the other, Dennis Eversoll, for armed robbery. During the trio's time in jail, Schmidt maintained a fondness for annoying other inmates and so one day both Farah and Eversoll snapped. They attacked Schmid, impaling him 20 times with a blade, causing him to lose both an eye and a kidney at the time, and his life just 10 days later. And finally, we have Fotios Freddy Gias and Paul J. Decalogero, who on October 30th of 2018 beat James Whiteley Bulger to death using a belt with a lock attached to it in the USP Hazleton prison in West Virginia, while a third inmate, Sean McKinnon, stood watch. Freddie Gias was a former mafia hitman and Paul De Colagero, a Massachusetts gangster. The pair killed Bulger likely after learning that he had been working as an informant for the FBI. Big no-no in prison. At the time of his death, Bulger had been serving a life sentence for killing 11 people as well as committing many other crimes in relation to the Irish Mafia. What's interesting about this particular case is that it 
hasn't actually gone to trial yet. Both Fotios, Freddy Gias, and Paul J. DeCologuero are set to go to court in West Virginia in December of 2024, which is this year. So, you know, if you're interested, keep up on the case. Stay tuned. One of America's most notorious serial killers is eligible for parole this year. This guy has been labeled a naturally born killer. Not only does he stand at six foot nine, weighing in at 250 pounds, but he also has a very high IQ. Mix that with a troubled childhood and a propensity to violence, and it's quite the dangerous concoction. He took the lives of his grandparents when he was just 15. About 10 years later, he killed his mother. Between May 1972 to April 1973, he took the lives of eight women. He would lure women into his car, drive them out to secluded locations, and then smother and suffocate them. He'd then bring the bodies back to his home where he'd them. Kemper ended up receiving eight consecutive life sentences for his crimes, but again, his next parole hearing is coming up this year. Now, I mean, it's very, very unlikely that anything will come of it. He's been denied parole at every other hearing pretty much immediately, or has even chosen to waive his right to a hearing himself. Next up, we have Robert Picton, who recently became eligible for day parole and will be eligible for full parole in 2027, 25 years after his original arrest date. He hasn't had his hearing yet, but the families of his victims have already come out saying that Robert Picton has no right Right to walk the earth after what he did. And yeah, you know what? I cannot with the sentencing that this guy was given. He received one life sentence. One. Are you kidding? He killed at least 26 women. However, he claims it was 49 and actually complained to an undercover officer that he never got his even 50. He said he was angry, furious, and disappointed with himself that he never got the full 5-0, his words, and now he's eligible for parole? Like what? What happened to consecutive life sentences or life without parole? It's honestly just insane. Why are there even talks about this? If you don't know who Robert Picton is, he's a British Columbia serial killer who was active from the 90s to the early 2000s. He's often referred to as the pig farm killer because his MO included violating his victims before taking their lives and running their bodies through a wood chipper on his farm before feeding the remains to his pigs. I really don't understand how any judge in their right mind would or even could approve parole in this case. The crimes were just so gruesome and heinous. If anything, I feel like we should be adding time to his sentence, not taking it away. Next on the list, we have Paul Bernardo. Now, this name may not be super familiar to those outside of Canada, but this guy is one of the creepiest, most despicable criminals in Canadian history. And his latest parole hearing just happened in February. So where do I start with this guy? He's a serial killer who would also his female victims and his former wife, Carla Homoka, would often assist in his crimes. They earned the nickname the Ken and Barbie Killers, and one of their victims was Carla's very own sister. Um, I remember when I first heard about the details of this case in law class in high school, I had this uncomfortable, just weird feeling for the rest of the day, possibly even a couple days after. I had this feeling like, man, who can I trust? Could I, could I ever really know someone? It's incredibly disturbing how different these two's outward appearance and reputation was compared to the heinous things they were doing in secret, until of course they were caught. Well, Bernardo has had a number of parole hearings. He insists that he's changed and that he's no longer a threat to the public, but thankfully he's been denied every time. But then again, Carla, God, she was, she was set free in 2005, so honestly, I, I wouldn't put it past them to let this guy go. Next up, we have Mark David Chapman, also known as the man who killed the Beatles, but more specifically, John Lennon, peace activist and co-songwriter, co-lead vocalist and rhythm guitarist of the Beatles. Of course, on the evening of December 8th of 1980, John Lennon was returning to his hotel when all of a sudden he heard someone shout his name. When Lennon turned around, Chapman pulled out a handheld weapon and fired four projectiles into Lennon. Two entered the left side of his back, which traveled through the left side of his chest and his left lung. One exited his body and the other became lodged in his neck. 
The other two bullets hit Lennon in his left shoulder. John made it to the hospital, but he was pronounced dead soon after. It was a terrible day in history that brought the world together in grief and mourning. John Lennon was loved and people were devastated at the loss. When Chapman was asked why he did it, he said that he wanted the world to know his name, but provided no other explanation. While he is eligible for parole, he has also been denied parole on 12 separate occasions, so I doubt he'll get it. Next on the list, we have Oscar Pistorius. Oscar Pistorius, known as the Blade Runner for his achievements in track and field, despite having both legs amputated as a child, competed in the 2012 Olympics in London. But just six months later, he took the life of his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp. On the early morning of February 14th, 2013, Pistorius killed his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp, with a firearm firing at her through a locked bathroom door in his home in Pretoria, South Africa. He claimed that he mistook her for an intruder and fired in self-defense, but the prosecution argued that it was premeditated. He ended up being convicted and with a maximum sentence of 15 years, but he was just released in January. His conditions being monitoring until his sentence expires and therapy sessions. Next we have Susan Smith, who is despicable. After killing her two sons, she was charged with life in prison, with the possibility of parole after 30 years. And guess what? It's been 30 years. On October 5th, back in 1994, Smith had called police officers to report a carjacking. Not only that, but Susan claimed that her two sons were in the car when it was stolen. Smith went on television and pleaded for their safe return, but she was full of it. Susan had killed her sons because she had secretly fallen in love with a man who didn't want children, and she believed that doing so would solve her relationship problems. When police discovered her car, it was clear that it had been delivered deliberately rolled into a lake with her sons inside. Smith's lawyer tried to plead mental insanity, but the argument didn't stick. In response to the idea of Susan Smith being approved for parole, one of her family members was quoted saying, I don't think she's got a snowball's chance in hell. Good. So luckily this guy's uh, parole was just recently revoked, but the story is pretty insane. So in 2000, Kenneth McKay met a woman named Crystal Paskeman at a bar in Saskatoon. He offered to give her a ride home that night, but she never made it home. Instead, McKay drove her to a secluded area of her and took her life. Then he set her remains on fire behind his truck. Infuriatingly, he was granted day parole in 2023. Prison officials weren't happy about this, warning that there was a high chance he'd reoffend. And guess what happened? He started stalking a female coworker just three months after being released. Luckily, he didn't get to carry out whatever plan he had before being arrested. Next up, we have Jeremy Wade Vojcovic, who just 22 years ago committed a violent crime that ended the life of a woman in Maple Ridge, British Columbia, named Colleen Findlay. Vojcovic came into contact with a woman while trespassing on her property. He beat her, bound her, and then set her and her home on fire before fleeing the scene. The court saw his actions as deliberate and methodical, and despite the fact that Vojcovic previously a day parole he received in 2022, and despite the fact that a psychiatric assessment expressed grave concern about the level of risk that he posed to the public, he's been given a 60-day unescorted absence from prison so that he may participate in a substance abuse treatment program at a residential facility in Vancouver Island. While he does have to return to the treatment facility nightly and is not allowed to consume or possess alcohol or illicit substances, it is still absolutely crazy to me that he has been allowed to leave prison at all. This next guy has to be one of the most despicable human beings alive today. Luis Gravito. This Colombian killer was nicknamed La Bestia or The Beast and the name really fits. Between 1992 to 1999, this guy took the lives of over 193 young people, very young, mostly males, and a lot of them lived on the street. It's very likely there's a much higher death toll on this guy's hands. Authorities have said it may be closer to 300. It's just never been confirmed. Not only did this evil prick take the lives of his victims, but he'd violate and torment them first. He would often pose as a priest or a monk in order to gain his victim's trust and lure them to their deaths. 
Police recovered a suitcase of his that contained journals detailing his crimes, as well as tally marks of his victims. It's incredibly sickening, and the fact that there were even discussions of this guy receiving parole recently should be a crime. He was originally sentenced to 1,853 years in prison, but Columbia law changed and maximum prison sentences were reduced to 40 years. And because Gravito assisted police in recovering the bodies of his victims, his sentence was further reduced to 22 years. He was eligible for parole just recently, but thankfully was not released. And to finish us off today, we have a man who is not up for parole, but actually received it back in 1973. And this is a perfect example of why this list is so absolutely terrifying. So in June of 1956, Richard Marquette was arrested for killing and dismembering Joan Ray Cottle. He then scattered her body parts around the city of Oregon to be discovered by police. He was given a life sentence for his crimes, but received full parole after just 12 years. 12 years. The police and the courts had found him to be polite and non-argumentative. And so even though he had taken the life of someone in a horrific fashion, Marquette was allowed to walk in 1973 after spending just 12 years in prison. Just 27 months later, in 1975, Marquette killed and dismembered 35-year-old Betty Lucille Wilson before dismembering her body and dumping her remains in a marsh. When he was arrested, he admitted that he had in fact killed two women since his release and led police to remains of the second victim. He's now serving his second life sentence in the Salem State Penitentiary and he is no longer eligible for parole. At number 10 is Jose Antonio Acosta Hernandez, aka El Diego. If evil is a measure of your body count, then Jose here tops the leaderboards. El Diego is the former leader of La Lina, the leading faction of the Juarez cartel. Originally established as a team of heavily armed ex and active duty police officers, this unit has evolved into the enforcement arm of the cartel, safeguarding narcotics traffickers from the criminal underworld. In 2012, Hernandez himself was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences, plus an additional 20 years for his involvement in a litany of crimes, including racketeering, narcotics trafficking, money laundering, and of course, the big M. And that M is big indeed, as Hernandez has confessed to orchestrating or partaking in over 1,500 unalivings between 2008 and 2012 alone. Hernandez finds himself serving not one, not two, but three consecutive life sentences plus an additional 20 years. His new permanent home is the ominous and supremely fortified confines of the ADX Florence Supermax facility, touted as the most secure correctional facility on the planet, even above maximum security prisons. Here, Hernandez resides in solitary confinement, as do all prisoners at ADX Florence, where he'll spend the rest of his days sitting with the consequences of his malevolent actions. If you're enjoying the video so far, you can support the channel by pressing the like button, subscribing to Most Amazing Top 10, and ringing that notification bell. Those who do can rest easy knowing that they're nowhere near as evil as number 9, Terry Nicholas. Terry Nicholas, American domestic terrorist infamous for his role in 1995 Oklahoma sitting bombing. Born on April 1st, 1995, Nicholas had an array of short-term jobs from farming to real estate before a fateful encounter with Timothy McVeigh during a stint in the U.S. Army. The reliance culminated in the tragedy of the Alfred P. Mora Federal Building on April 19, 1995, claiming 186 lives. In 1997, Nicholas was found guilty in a federal trial on charges including conspiracy to use weapon of mass destruction and involuntary man unaliving, which stemmed for the tragic demise of federal law enforcement personnel. Although the plaintiff sought the capital punishment, aka the unalive penalty, the jury couldn't reach a consensus, and so instead he served a life sentence without parole. He also faced state charges during yet another trial in Oklahoma, where he was convicted of a staggering 160 61 counts of first degree unaliving, arson, and conspiracy, but yet again the state jury was unable to decide on whether to oppose capital punishment. As a result, he's serving 161 consecutive life sentences at ADX Florence in Colorado. On the other hand, his co conspirator Timothy McVeigh, who planned and carried out the whole wasn't so lucky. McVeigh was executed in 2001. At number 8 is Luis Felipe, aka King Blue. Hailing from Havana, Cuba, Felipe made his way to the United States during the Mariel boat lift of 1990, an event famously depicted in Scarface. Among the so-called undesirables sent to the US was Luis Felipe, who would end up in Chicago where he would first come into contact with the notorious Latin King Street Gang. Fast forward to 1986 and he moved to the Big Apple where he founded the New York chapter of the Latin Kings. But eventually Luis Felipe was arrested on unaliving charges after he unalived his girlfriend while under the influence, serving nine years at the Collins Correctional Facility in New York. But the tale 
only gets darker from here. See, in 95, he found himself convicted of orchestrating multiple unalivings from behind bars, penning the orders to fellow Latin kings on the outside. This led to his sentencing of life imprisonment, plus an additional 45 years, served in strict solitary confinement with absolutely zero communication with the outside world. Currently, King Blood resides in the notorious ADX Florence. At number 7 is Caboni Savage, whose name isn't just fitting, it's an understatement. Emerging as a dealer in Hunting Park, Savage is said to become a kingpin, orchestrating the distribution of vast quantities of nose powder throughout North Philadelphia from 98 to 04. Savage's malevolence escalated when he was accused of personally slaying a stranger. Notably, he even ordered hits on competitors and adversaries, including orchestrating the demise of a rival dealer, Carlton Brown. His ruthless grip extended to intimidation, with threats aimed at witnesses' families, but unfortunately, those threats turned out to be promises. Enter Eugene Twin Coleman, once in cahoots with Savage, who testified against Savage in a narcotics trial, leading to Savage's conviction. Savage retaliated by orchestrating the arson of Marcella Coleman's house, and the bombing claimed six lives. Kaboni Savage ended up receiving 13 consecutive unaliving sentences, while Lewis was only given a 40 year sentence on account of the stark differences on the level of remorsefulness displayed during their testimonies. At number 6 is Daria Nikolvenius Saltikova, commonly known as Saltichika. Born into a rich Russian noble family in the year 1730, Saltikova lived alone in her estate after the passing of her husband. You see, Saltikova had some serious connections in high places, rubbing elbows with the powerful elite, but eventually the persistence of victims' relatives relatives caught the attention of none other than Empress Catherine II. Saltikova was arrested and held for six years while authorities held a painstaking investigation which counted as many as 138 suspicious unalivings. After a public trial, Saltikova was found guilty of, of ending the lives of at least 38 female serfs through brutal beatings and torture. Eventually, she was sentenced to life imprisoned in Moscow, where she spent the first 11 out of 33 years chained in a basement dungeon without a window and only given a candle during meals. And number five is Robert Mosley, aka Hannibal Lecter. The longest serving British prisoner in solitary confinement had a troubled youth marked by violence claimed father. In the 1960s, he turned to night walking due to substance addiction and sought psychiatric help after attempting self-harm, citing disturbing voices in his head which urged him to assassinate his parents. He said that if he had, he would have never committed any of his future and alivings. In 1974, he strangled John Farrell, who had shown Maudsley pictures of his kidnapped victims. He turned himself in, leading to his institutionalization at Broadmere Hospital. In 1977, Maudsley and another inmate brutally tortured and eliminated another inmate, resulting in another conviction and transferred to Wakefield Prison, where he brutally attacked and off two fellow inmates, displaying extreme violence and earning him the nickname Hannibal the Cannib- I mean, Anthropophage, because that's better somehow. Deemed far too dangerous, Mosley occupies a two-cell basement unit and is always escorted by four officers outside of his cell. At number four is James Marcello, aka Little Jimmy, aka Jimmy Light, aka Jimmy the Man. In April 2005, the spotlight shone on front boss of the Chicago outfit and his half-brother, Michael Mickey Marcello as they face charges for racketeering, conspiracy, loan sharking, running illegal gambling schemes, and 18 separate counts of unliving people. Marcello's bid for freedom saw him offering a staggering $12.5 million worth of homes in bond collateral, a desperate attempt thwarted by the US District Judge. The former boss is now serving a life sentence in solitary at, you guessed it, the ADX floor at Supermax facility. Speaking of which, number 3 is Thomas Silverstein, America's most isolated man. This dude just can't seem to stop offing people. Thomas Silverstein Silverstein's life in prison began at 19 for armed robbery and he was sent to San Quentin. After some more crimes, he landed in Leavenworth, Kansas with a 15 year sentence. And in 1980, he earned a life sentence for eliminating an inmate who wouldn't be a pawn in his substance distribution scheme. He moved to USP Marion, enduring extreme solitary confinement, but nevertheless, he was accused of another murder in 81 and got another life sentence, leading to his feud with rival gang member Raymond Lee Cadillac Smith, who he also eventually assassinated as the guards did nothing to keep the two apart. Then, after that, he orchestrated a guard's assassination and faced more life sentences. The guard's assassination served as the final straw, leading to a 23-year lockdown at the prison and inspiring a whole new prison design. Silverstein spent 36 years in solitary there, passing away as the longest held prisoner in the Bureau of Prisons. Zokar Tarsnev, who, along with his brother Tamerlan, orchestrated the infamous and devastating Boston Marathon. The brothers placed pressure cooker near the finish line, causing three people to lose their lives and astounding 281 others to be injured in the aftermath. Just th just three days later, after their faces were revealed to the public thanks to CCTV footage, they fatally assassinated MIT police officer Sean Collier, not because they were identified, but because they wanted to steal his firearm. Then they hijacked an SUV and engaged in a wild with the police, even throwing 
bombs at them. As Zokar was trying to escape law enforcement, he drove over his own brother, dragging him under the stolen SUV about 30 feet. His brother didn't survive, and Zokar abandoned the SUV and vanished on foot into the night, triggering an unprecedented manhunt of epic proportions. He was eventually discovered hiding in a boat in a Watertown backyard, not far from where he had ditched the SUV. Inside the boat, scribbled on the cabin wall with a pen, the bomber left a note claiming the responsibility for the marathon attack, citing vengeance for US military actions in Afghanistan and Iraq. It coldly referred to the innocent victims as collateral damage, drawing eerie parallels to the casualties of war. He even expressed complete lack of remorse for having unalived his own brother. Ultimately, justice caught up with Tarzanev. He faced trial where he is convicted of a staggering 30 counts, and his fate was sealed with a sentence of capital punishment. At number one is Clara Homolka, who gets the top spot for being Canadian. Sure doesn't make me proud. Back in the late 1990s, Clara Homolka and her partner in crime, Paul Bernardo, engaged in some truly heinous acts. Responsible for the demise of not one, not two, but three innocent women, one of whom happened to be Clara's own sister, Tammy. Now, once her co-conspirator got nabbed by the authorities in 83, Clara decided to switch gears and claim that she was actually dragged into this nightmare against her will, painting herself as the unwilling accomplice. She then struck a deal that landed her a relatively lenient sentence of 12 years, and all she had to do was spill the beans on Paul. Jump back to the year 2007, and guess who's back on the streets? That's right you guys, she didn't need to escape prison because, well, they let her out onto the streets willy nilly. That's right, Homoka, now a mom of two and remarried, and get this, she's volunteering at a school in Montreal. Parents everywhere were like, hold up, are we seriously gonna let a former serial unaliver be around our miniature clones? Well, that was quite the unsettling journey through the lives of those who find themselves eternally secluded from the outside world. Number 10. Paul Bernardo. He is a Canadian serial killer and more, who was dubbed the schoolgirl uh, other monikers I can't say, thanks to the interwebs hating the R word, and together with his former wife, Carla Homoka, one half of the Ken and Barbie Beneath his charming facade, he developed pyromaniac inclinations and dark sexual fantasies in his youth, one of which involved creating a virgin farm where he would breed virgin girls to take advantage of. Later in life, Paul was diagnosed with sadism, voyeurism, narcissistic personality disorder, and met the requirements for a diagnosis of psychopathy. So that checks. Between 1987 and 1990, Bernardo committed increasingly vicious serial crimes in and around Scarborough, attacking most of his victims after stalking them as they got off buses late in the evening. During this time frame, he met and got engaged to Carla Homolka, and that's when things escalated from crimes to well, there are three notable I'm just going to talk about the one that disturbs me the most for time purposes. Although he was engaged to Carla, Paul had become obsessed with her younger sister Tammy, peering into her window and entering her room to get himself off while she slept. Six months before their 1991 wedding, Carla stole sleeping pills from the clinic she was working at and on December 23rd of 1990, Carla and Paul administered said pills to Tammy in a rum and eggnog cocktail. When Tammy lost consciousness, Carla and Bernardo undressed her and Carla applied a halothane soaked cloth to her sister's nose and mouth. Carla wanted to give Tammy's virginity to Paul for Christmas. Since according to her, he was disappointed that he wasn't Carla's first sexual partner, and the duo also had a video camera on hand for the experience. You can't make stuff like this up. Tammy began to vomit and they tried to revive her and called 911 after hiding evidence, you know, dressing Tammy and moving her into the bedroom, but Tammy never woke up. Despite being observed vacuuming and washing laundry in the middle of the night, and you know with the evidence of a chemical burn on Tammy's face, the regional municipality of Niagara Coroner and Carla's family accepted the couple's version of a Events, that she had just choked on her own mm, after consumption of, you know, bad things. After Tammy's death, Paul and Carla videotaped themselves engaging in sexual intercourse, with Carla wearing Tammy's clothing and pretending to be her. Thankfully, nowadays, Paul is in jail for the rest of his life, but uh, Carla's out in public, living alone in Salaberry de Valley Field. Number 9, Issei Sagawa. He is an infamous Japanese serial killer who was convicted in the 1980s for the killing and consumption of a fellow student. For reference, he was born into a wealthy family in Tokyo and studied at the prestigious Sorbonne University in Paris. In 1981, he classmate Rene Hartvelt and was arrested the following day after police found evidence of people munching in the apartment, including traces of human remains in the refrigerator. Sagawa was charged with committing a and sent to a mental hospital for evaluation, where he was eventually diagnosed with a mental illness that caused him to act impulsively and without regard for others. He was eventually released from prison after serving just two years due to his mental illness, although he remains under constant supervision and has to check in regularly with his doctor. Despite this, he has become something of a celebrity in Japan and has published a book detailing his experience of the crime, his trial, and his time in prison. Technically, I know I'm cheating a little since he isn't in jail anymore, but with his condition and his past, I definitely won't want to run into him in public. Number 8, Eric Rudolph. 
Rudolph. So Eric Rudolph is an American extremist who was responsible for a series of explosives in the United States between 1996 to 1998. After dropping out of school in the 8th grade, he joined the United States Army and served as a paratrooper from 1986 to 1989. In the early 1990s, Rudolph became a militant anti-abortion activist and began constructing homemade explosives using instructions from the anarchist cookbook. In 1996, Rudolph targeted two abortion clinics in Birmingham, Alabama and a gay nightclub in Atlanta, Georgia. He then attacked Centennial Olympic Park during the 1996 Summer Olympics one person and injuring more than 100 others. All in all, Rudolph is believed to be responsible for four explosive events, resulting in the deaths of two people and injuries to more than 150 others. Following a massive FBI investigation, he was finally apprehended in 2003 after hiding out in the Appalachian Mountains for more than five years. In 2005, he pleaded guilty to the crimes and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. He's currently serving his sentence at ADX Florence, a federal prison in Colorado. Number 7. Glenn Stark Chambers Before his time in prison, 23-year-old Glenn was living with his 22-year-old girlfriend, waitress Connie Weeks, in Sarasota, Florida. The relationship seems to have not been ideal. Uh, back in January of 1975, a policeman intervened to prevent Glenn from physically attacking Connie on the street during an argument when he already had her hair in his fist. The policeman, who was off-duty at the time, arrested Glenn on the spot and called for backup to bring him to jail, but Connie bailed him out later that day. That same night, Glenn showed up at the Sarasota Memorial Hospital, Carrie and Connie in a arms, claiming she'd slipped in the shower. It was a stupid lie, and the doctors and nurses who tended to Connie phoned the police. She passed away in the hospital later that week, and a judge sentenced Glenn to the electric chair. Now, the young man attempted to escape almost immediately upon arriving in prison, attacking a guard with two accomplices and managing to climb out a window. Now, the first attempt didn't get very far, with all three men being caught, and a Florida judge added five years to Glenn's life term. By 1990, Glenn seemed to be turning over a new leaf, with his behavior over those 15 years being described as exemplary, and prison authorities gave him permission to work in a furniture construction shop, designed to give you know inmates vocational training and a sense of purpose. On February 21st of 1990, he slipped into one of those boxes of furniture that was said to be shipped off the premises to a warehouse. No one noticed the extra weights as they loaded the crate onto the truck, nor did they notice, during the entire drive to Daytona Beach, anything shifting around in the back of the truck, like no footsteps, no clunking lids, no sound of the back panel sliding open or dropping shut, nothing. Upon arrival, however, one open crate contained a discarded prisoner's uniform, and the correctional institute was, um, isn't a man. No one has yet to hear from him again, and he has been allegedly spotted in Florida and Alabama, but not officially found. Number six, Damien Folks. He is an infamous prisoner who was convicted in 2002 of two women in England, and thankfully was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Now, Damien originally had a long criminal history and was known as a cold and calculating individual. To go into detail, he was found guilty of um, impaling one woman in her chest while she was sleeping, and then strangling the other with a ligature, before leaving their bodies in a disused pub. Damien was diagnosed with several mental illnesses, including schizophrenia, had an IQ of just 64, but was deemed to be sane enough to stand trial. During the trial, he admitted to two women, but claimed he did so in a fit of rage after being provoked. In 2013, Damien was also convicted of attempting to kill a prison guard by throwing boiling water over him. He's serving his sentence at HMP Wakefield, one of Britain's most secure prisons. There, he's been described as a cold-blooded and callous and is considered to be one of the most dangerous prisoners in the country. Number 5. Chris Watts Chris Watts is a notorious criminal from Colorado who killed a pregnant wife and two daughters. In August of 2018, he pleaded guilty to nine counts of unlawful termination of a pregnancy, and three counts of tampering with a deceased human body. He'd been having an affair with a co-worker before the and stated in interviews that he wanted to leave his family for her. On August 13th of 2018, Chris killed his pregnant wife and two daughters by um, asphyxiating them to death in their own home. After killing his family, he disposed of their bodies in oil tanks on the grounds of the property where he worked. The case gained worldwide attention and prompted investigations into the family's background and past. Chris received five life sentences in November of 2018 and is currently serving his sentence at Dodge Correctional Institution in Wisconsin. Now, he's one of the most infamous criminals in recent history and uh, quite the example of how seemingly normal people can commit heinous crimes. Number 4. John Childs John Childs, also known as Bruce Childs, is a British hitman and serial from East London who was convicted in 1979 for a series of apparent contract and uh, none of the bodies have been found to this day. He confessed to having committed the crimes to Detective Chief Superintendent Frank Cater in June of 1979 after he was arrested in September of 1978 for a series of bank and security van robberies in Hertfordshire. The investigation was based at Walton Abbey Police Station in Essex, where John was convicted of carrying out the deaths of Terence Terry Eve, Robert Brown, George Brett, Terry Brett, Frederick Freddie Sherwood, and Ronald Andrews from November of 1974 to October of 1978. Also, the weapons for these 
haven't been found yet, which uh, is just as scary when you think about the skill level for hiding all of that. Number three, Robert Maudsley. Robert John Maudsley is an English man convicted of multiple He killed four people, with one of the kids taking place in a psychiatric hospital and two in prison after receiving a life sentence for previous as a teenager during the late 1960s, Robert sought out psychiatric help after several life-ending attempts, and it was during his talk with doctors that he claimed to hear voices telling him to kill his parents. In 1974, Robert garroted John Farrell in Wood Green, London, and soon after surrendered himself to police, saying he needed psychiatric help. He was found unfit to stand trial and instead was sent to Broadmoor Hospital. In 1977, he and another patient, David Cheeseman, who at the time was serving a sentence for sexual crimes, locked themselves in a cell with a third patient named David Francis, who committed crimes I can't even say on here. The duo punished David Francis to death over a period of nine hours, and after this incident, Monsley was convicted of manslaughter and sent to Wakefield Prison. In 1978, he two fellow prisoners at Wakefield in one day, even though he had originally set out to seven, you know, underachieving. So yeah, if you value your life, maybe transfer out of that jail if you're there. Number two, Arthur Hutchinson. So Arthur is a convicted triple Born in Hartlepool, County Durham, he attained notoriety in 1984 when he was convicted of the committed in Door Sheffield, South Yorkshire, on the 23rd of October in 1983. He remains in prison and since 2008 has made a number of legal challenges to try and overturn his life sentence. Now, he had already spent more than five years in prison for the attempted killing of his half-brother, Dino, before that fateful day in 1983 when he arrived at Selby Police Station after being arrested on suspicion of theft, burglary, and um, sexual harm. He has to go to the washroom and while he was there, jumped out of a window in an attempt to escape and cut his knee on barbed wire. After three and a half weeks on the run, Hutchison broke into the home of Basil Leitner, his wife, and their son via, you know, a patio window and impaled all three of them to death. After spending another two weeks on the run, wearing disguises and moving from place to place in Barnsley and many other places that I cannot pronounce, he was finally caught on a farm in Hartlepool on November 5th of 1983. During his trial on September 11th of 1984, he accused Mike Barron, then a reporter with the Sunday Mirror, of committing said crimes. Hutchinson was found guilty of all accusations, though, on September 14th, after a four hour deliberation and sentenced to life in prison. Number one, Luca Magnata. So for some context, Jun Lin, also known as Justin, arrived in Canada back in 2010 with the intention of starting a new life and, you know, to study computer engineering and settled down in Quebec. He was living with a man for a period of time as an openly gay man here in Canada, but sadly wasn't out to his parents, who were pressuring him to settle down and marry a woman, and tension from this caused him to break up with his boyfriend. I promise, I promise, it's relevant. After breaking up with his boyfriend, Lin had been using Grindr and other web applications to meet with men, and through a Craigslist ad, he met Luca Magnata, and sadly, that's where this tale goes sour. Lynn was last seen on May 24th of 2012 when his friends reported getting a text message from him around 9pm. Three of his friends went into his apartment on May 27th after not hearing from him and reported him missing on the 29th. On May 25th, an 11 minute video titled One Lunatic, One Ice Pick was uploaded online depicting a naked male tied to a bed frame being repeatedly impaled with what was later established to be a screwdriver and a kitchen stabby implement, then dismembered, followed by acts of necrophilia. The perpetrator used that kitchen device and a fork to cut off some flesh, and police have seen a longer version of the video where acts of people munching were committed. Several hours after Lynn, Magnata booked a round trip ticket for a flight from Montreal to Paris using a passport with his own name. Police confirmed on May 30th that the video was sadly authentic and identified Lynn as the victim. On June 13th of 2012, the four limbs and torso that had been mailed to various political parties were matched to Lynn using DNA samples from his family. On July 1st, his head was recovered at the edge of a small lake in Montreal's Angry Gone Park after police received an anonymous tip. Going back to June 4th though, Magnata was finally apprehended by Berlin police at an internet cafe while reading news stories about himself after quite the manhunt. He tried giving fake names before admitting who he was, and his identity was confirmed through fingerprint evidence. He's been sentenced to life in prison, and thank goodness for that. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Jason Barnum. Jason Barnum, also known as Eyeball due to his tattooed right eye, is a figure who has gained notoriety for his life of crime and distinctive appearance. Born in Alaska, Barnum's life took a dark turn as he succumbed to a struggle with addiction and criminal activities. In 2012, Barnum's life of crime culminated culminated in a series of events that would land him in a maximum security prison. He was involved in a string of burglaries, car thefts, and a shooting incident with the police that left an officer injured. His actions during this crime spree demonstrated a dangerous disregard for human life and the law. During his court proceedings, the judge, while acknowledging Burnham's difficult upbringing and struggles with addiction, sentenced him to 22 years in prison for his crimes. In our number 9 spot today, we have Alexander Pichushkin. Alexander 
Alexander Petrushkin is a figure of terror known by the spine chilling epithet, the chessboard killer. His goal, as horrifying as it was unique, was to take a life for each space on a chessboard, a total of 64 individuals. This chilling ambition set him apart from other criminals and made him a feared figure not only in his operating base of Moscow, but also around the world. Alexander's reign of terror was marked by a level of brutality that left a trail of carnage in his wake. His victims were not merely killed, they were subjected to violent deaths that really showed the depth of his ruthlessness. The authorities eventually convicted him for 48 killings, however, Petrushkin himself claims a higher count, insisting that his total stands at 60 victims. Whether this claim is the truth or an attempt to inflate his notoriety remains uncertain. What is clear, however, is that the sheer scale of his crimes, coupled with his terrifying goal, makes him a figure of dread. His chilling ambition and the brutal reality of his crimes make Alexander Petrushkin a prisoner whose release would be a nightmare come true. In our number eight spot today, we have Richard Lee McNair. Richard Lee McNair is a name that has become synonymous with cunning escapes and audacious evasion. Convicted for killering and burglary in the 80s, McNair's story took a turn for the extraordinary when he demonstrated a knack for escaping prison. Not once but three times. His most infamous escape was from a maximum security prison in Louisiana in 2006. In a plot that seemed straight out of a Hollywood movie, McNair slipped out of the prison work detail by mailing himself out of the prison in a crate. Once outside, he managed to evade capture for over a year, leading authorities on a nationwide manhunt. McNair's ability to charm and deceive, coupled with his physical fitness, made him a formidable fugitive. His escapes and subsequent recaptures were widely covered in the media, earning him a reputation as a real-life escape artist. Finally captured in Canada in 2007, McNair is now held in the Supermax prison, ADX Florence in Colorado. His story serves as a chilling reminder of the lengths some prisoners will go to to regain their freedom. Richard Lee McNair is undoubtedly a figure you pray never escapes again. In our number seven spot today, we have Terry Nichols. Terry Nichols is a name that sends chills down the spine of anyone familiar with the horrific Oklahoma City bombing. Nichols, along with his accomplice, Timothy McVeigh, orchestrated one of the deadliest acts of domestic terror in U.S. history. On April 19, 1995, a truck exploded outside the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, killing 168 people and injuring hundreds more. Nichols, a former army buddy of McVeigh's, was deeply involved in the planning and preparation of the attack. His anti-government sentiments and extremist beliefs fueled his participation in this act of terror. Following the attack, Nichols was quickly apprehended and brought to justice. In a trial that gripped the nation, Nichols was convicted of conspiracy conspiracy to use a weapon of mass destruction, as well as other charges relating to the seriousness of his crimes. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole and is currently held in the ADX Florence Maximum Security Prison in Colorado, the same one we just talked about. In our number six spot today, we have Gary Ridgway. Gary Ridgway is a name that evokes a chilling sense of dread and is notoriously known as the Green River Killer. This ominous moniker stems from his gruesome modus operandi, which involved leaving the bodies of his victims along the Green River in Washington. The river, once a symbol of natural beauty, became a grim reminder of Ridgway's merciless killing spree. Ridgway's crimes were not sporadic instances of violence, but a series of premeditated killings that made him one of the most prolific serial killers in history. Officially, he was convicted of 49 crimes, but the actual number of his victims is believed to be at least double that count. What made Ridgway even more terrifying was not just the scale of his crimes, but also his attitude towards them. In a chilling display of lack of empathy, Ridgway confessed his crimes without any visible signs of emotion or remorse. This cold-blooded confession provided a terrifying insight into the mind of a remorseless killer, revealing a man devoid of any empathy or guilt for his heinous actions. The enormity of his crimes, coupled with his emotionless demeanor, makes Gary Ridgway a prisoner whose release would be a horrifying prospect. His chilling legacy continues to haunt those familiar with his story, making him a figure whose freedom is prayed against. In our number five spot today, we have Dennis Rader. Dennis Rader is more widely recognized by his chilling moniker, BTK, an abbreviation which disturbingly describes his preferred method of killing. Rader's reign of terror spans 
spanned over 17 years in Wichita, Kansas, a time during which he took a perverse pleasure in his horrific acts, savoring the terror he instilled in the hearts of residents. Raider wasn't merely a man who committed heinous crimes, he was a sadist who reveled in his victims' suffering and the dread he inspired. His chilling letters to the police where he arrogantly flaunted his crimes added an extra layer of psychological terror to his spree. The letters served as a chilling reminder of his presence, keeping the community in a constant state of fear and uncertainty. These communications revealed a deeply disturbed mind, one that was not just content with the physical act of his horrific crimes, but also sought to manipulate and terrorize an entire community. Raider's pleasure in his cruel actions, his taunting letters, and the psychological torment he subjected Wichita to make the thought of this man walking free a very unsettling prospect. And one that will probably never come true, thankfully. In our number four spot today, we have Cleophas Prince Jr. In the shadowy realm of San Diego's suburban streets lurked a menacing phantom during the 1990s. Cleophas Prince Jr., at the time known as the Claremont Killer, turned the 90s into a real life horror show. Over nine dreadful months, he embarked on a relentless hunt, marking women as his prey in the seemingly serene Claremont neighborhood. To do this, he would either break into their homes when they least expected it, or switch we talk them into some quiet, out of the way spot. During his reign of terror, while the local news was all over it, the rest of the world hardly blinked. During this time, the stage of national and international press was captivated by other monstrous players such as Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy, which casted a horrific shadow that eclipsed the terrifying exploits of Cleophas. Thankfully, however, in September 1990, thanks to some top notch detective work and breakthroughs in forensic science, they finally pinned the tail on the donkey. Cleophas Prince Jr., Mr. Claremont Killer himself, got nabbed. The courts threw the book at him, and now he is chilling behind bars for the rest of his days. No parole, no second chances. In our number three spot today, we have Pedro Rodriguez Filo. Also known as the Padrino Matador, he is a Brazilian serial killer who is believed to have killed over 70 people, mostly other criminals, in the 1960s and the 1970s. He had a very difficult childhood as his father was a notorious criminal who actually really sadly harmed and killed his mother, and this of course had a profound influence on Pedro and his life. This experience is believed to have contributed to his violent behavior later in life. Pedro began his crime spree at a super young age and he started with a horrific crime when he killed the vice mayor of his town who he believed was responsible for the death of his girlfriend. He continued to kill other criminals, often targeting those who had previously wronged him or his family. Pedro was arrested in 1973 and was eventually convicted of killing 71 people. He is currently serving a prison sentence in Brazil and is known for his outspoken and unrepentant attitude towards his crimes. While I am sure we can all feel sympathy for the things that Pedro experienced in life, it truly is no excuse for the things that he chose to do. In our number two spot today we have Charles Ng. Charles Ng is a name that will send chills down the spine and he was a key player in the reign of terror that unfolded in the 1980s. Alongside his equally terrifying accomplice Leonard Lake, Ng played a significant role in a series of crimes that remain etched into the annals of criminal history for their sheer depravity and cruelty. The grim saga began when Ng and Lake joined forces to unleash a wave of horror that would haunt their victims and the public alike. Their modus operandi was chill Killing. Unsuspecting individuals would be lured into their grasp only to be subjected to unimaginable torture, their final moments filled with fear and agony. What made their reign of terror even more horrifying was the duo's penchant for recording their despicable acts. These videos served as a chilling testament to their inhumanity, a grotesque spectacle of their victims suffering under their hands. Ig's role in these crimes was not that of a mere spectator, he was a very active participant, his cold-blooded nature making him a figure of dread. This, combined with his seeming indifference to the pain and suffering of his victims, made him one of the most feared inmates in the prison system. His heinous acts have left a dark stain on his name, making Charles Ng a prisoner that many pray to never see free again. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have David Berkowitz. David Berkowitz, a figure shrouded in infamy and widely recognized by his chilling moniker, the Son of Sam. He struck fear into the heart of New York City in the late 
1970s. His name became synonymous with a wave of terror that swept through the city as he embarked on a series of shootings that left the public in a state of constant fear and uncertainty. Berkowitz's crimes were not random acts of violence. They were methodically planned and executed with a chilling precision that left the authorities baffled and the public on edge. Each attack added to the growing panic, creating an atmosphere of dread that permeated the city. But it wasn't just his crimes that made Berkowitz a figure of terror. His claims of demonic possession added a layer of horror to his already frightening persona. These claims, whether true or the product of a deranged mind, painted a picture of a man under the influence of dark forces, making him an even more unsettling figure. The combination of his heinous crimes, alleged demonic possession, and erratic behavior made him a prisoner that one would fervently pray never walks free again. And we're starting things off with Alan Legere, aka the monster of Miramichi. Born in 1948 in New Brunswick, this guy committed a robbery with two accomplices in 1986 that resulted in the brutal beating of both of the owners who were an elderly couple. One of which, the husband, John Glending, did not survive. The trio were arrested and Legere began serving time at the Atlantic Institution Maximum Security Penitentiary. In 1989, he was transported to a hospital due to an ear infection and it was there that he would make his escape. He pleaded with the guards to allow him to go to the washroom alone and somehow he managed to get them to agree. Once he was inside the bathroom, he pulled out the small sharpened piece of metal he'd hidden up his rear and picked the lock to his handcuffs. He fled from the hospital and through a series of carjackings managed to avoid being captured for seven whole months. And he didn't lay low during this time either. He took the lives of four more people in completely random attacks. He burnt a victim's home down with two sisters inside, attacked another woman, Annie Flam, and her sister. This sister managed to make it out alive, and he took the life of Reverend Father James Smith. He was finally arrested again though, and remains in prison till this day. Number 9, Nikolai Zamugliev aka Metal Fang. Nikolai took the lives of at least five women engaging in brutal acts of violence that shocked the nation. He would then consume some of the body parts of his victims. His crimes earned him the nickname Metal Fang due to the dental work he used to bite his victims. He'd lost some of his teeth in a fight when he was younger, being fitted with metal dentures. In 1979, he was finally captured and sent to a mental hospital. He was released in just less than a year though, and guess what? He took the lives of three more victims, the last of which was actually a friend of his. He invited some friends over for a dinner party and at one point, guests found him in the next room having crouched next to his friend, eating him. He would spend eight years in a treatment center, but while being transported to another facility in 1989, he managed to escape. He managed to stay hidden for years, living in the mountains of Kyrgyzstan. He likely would have been found if it weren't for the fact that he got tired of this life and, and basically turned himself in. He remains housed in a specialized psychiatric clinic to this day. Next on the list is Gonzalo Lopez. Lopez was a convicted criminal with multiple life sentences. He made his escape from prison in May 2022, serving life terms for taking the life of Jose Ramirez in 2006 and the shooting of two police officers. Lopez saw an opportunity during a hospital transfer. While being transported with 15 other inmates, he seized the moment, stabbing the corrections officer before making off with the vehicle. Police shot the tires, but he managed to drive for another mile before crashing it and then fleeing into the forest. Lopez remained a fugitive, managing to evade law enforcement for several weeks. Tragically, on June 2nd, he resurfaced at a family ranch in Centerville, Texas, where he committed a horrific act, resulting in the deaths of five individuals, 66-year-old Mark Collins and his four grandchildren. The manhunt for Lopez intensified, and later that same day, a shootout between Lopez and the police broke out. In the end, Lopez got what he deserved, and no officers were harmed. Number seven. Texas 7. Texas 7 was a group of seven convicts who pulled off a prison escape in December of 2000. These inmates serving sentences for various crimes were all going to be in prison for a long time and feeling like they had nothing to lose, they planned an escape. They managed to overpower and subdue prison employees at the John B. Connolly unit in Kennedy, Texas. Using stolen weapons and clothing, they took advantage of a maintenance truck's cover and 
made their getaway. Their escape set off a massive manhunt across Texas. The group was on the run for over a month, committing a series of robberies and other crimes to help sustain themselves. They even took the life of a police officer during a robbery. The Texas 7's run came to an end though on January 22nd, 2001 in Woodland Park, Colorado, when a tip led authorities to their hideout. There'd been an episode, I believe, uh, I can't remember the show, a lot, uh, Unsolved Mysteries or something, where they showed them and like a bunch of people phoned in being like, I think I've seen those guys. Anyway, there was a standoff with law enforcement. One member took his own life and the rest were apprehended. The majority of them are now on death row. Next up, we have Sharon Kinney. Unlike most of the criminals on this list, Sharon has still yet to be found. Suspected of being responsible for the deaths of three individuals, including her husband, James, and the wife of a boyfriend in 1960, Kinney's actions led to a series of trials. She faced three unsuccessful attempts at prosecution for the death of her husband. As the fourth trial loomed, Kinney made a bold move and fled off to Mexico to evade justice. And while in Mexico, she became involved in yet another deadly encounter, claiming self-defense when she shot and killed a man. But Mexican authorities, uh, you know, they just weren't buying it. And she ended up being convicted, landing her in Mexican prison with a 13-year sentence. On December 7th, 1969, just four years into her sentence, she uh, capitalized on the facility's lax security measures. There was also a prison blackout, which helped, and she ended up making her escape, slipping away into the night, never to be seen again. To this day, Sharon Kinney remains at large, holding one of the longest outstanding warrants in American history. At our number five spot, Richard Matt and David Sweat were two dangerous inmates who pulled off a daring escape from Clinton Correctional Facility in Dannemora, New York in 2015. These criminals used cunning and tools to cut through steel walls and pipes within their cells, and over a period of months, they created this series of tunnels and passages within the prison's walls, leading to the catwalks and utility tunnels. On the night of June 6, 2015, Matt and Sweat made their move. They crawled through the labyrinth of passages they'd made, emerging through a manhole cover outside the prison's walls. Of course, a manhunt was launched, with law enforcement across the state and beyond joining in on the hunt. They managed to evade capture for a number of weeks, robbing cabins and seeking refuge in the wilderness. Richard Matt lost his life at the hands of law enforcement on June 26th, that David Sweat was captured again two days later, weakened and suffering from gunshot wounds. Next on the list is Donald Leroy Evans. This guy uh, was an absolute despicable prick. He took the lives of multiple people between 1985 and 1991. The true extent of these crimes, I can't get into. He did more than just strangle people to death, though. He would usually attack his victims at rest stops and public parks. And even though he was initially only connected to three cases, he later admitted to being responsible for the unsolved deaths of 70 other people across 22 states. In June of 1993, while in custody at Harrison County Jail, he managed to escape along with three other inmates. Luckily, it didn't take the cops long to find him. He had been hiding out in a shed. Evans ended up getting the death penalty, but his death would come much quicker than it likely would have. Thankfully, he was uh, stabbed in the shower by a fellow death row inmate in 1999. And at number three, Alexander Solonik, nicknamed Russian Jackal and Alexander the Great. This guy was a Russian mob hitman and was damn good at his job. He was also really good at escaping from prison, apparently, which he did a number of times. The long arm of justice had finally caught up with him and he was arrested, but he managed to escape out of the courthouse window, fleeing to Siberia. He was caught and arrested again, spending two years in jail for escaping through the ventilation system. He went back to working as a hitman, but after a shootout in 1995, he was arrested once again in Moscow. The mob managed to bribe a guard to help him escape this time, and he exited his cell, scaling the wall with help of a rope and some climbing gear, and then entered into a waiting BMW. He headed to Greece, where he intended to spend the rest of his days, I guess, and uh, that's exactly what happened, only he didn't live as long as he wanted or expected to. The mob wanted to tie up any loose ends and enlisted one of Solonik's very own friends, a fellow hitman, to take him out. 
This guy like sounds like the real life John Wick or something. Next on the list we have James Earl Ray. Ray, who is serving a 99 year prison sentence for the uh, for killing civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. managed to escape from prison for a second time on August 7th of 1997. This escape occurred at the Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary in Tennessee. Ray and six other inmates managed to escape, but their freedom was short lived as law enforcement launched a massive manhunt and just three days later on June 3rd, he was recaptured in a wooded area about eight miles from the prison. His second escape was uh, not as successful as his first. Had also been in prison for something else before that incident and managed to escape for like months or something like that. Ultimately though, led to tighter security measures in the prison system and Ray would spend the rest of his life behind bars, dying in prison in 1998.